program will now begin. Welcome to this virtual event on championing gender sensitive security sector reform. I'm Milan Bervere, the director of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security. And we are so pleased to be able to co-host this discussion with the permanent mission of the United Arab Emirates to the United Nations. This is the fourth in a series that we have done together focused on the role of women in post-conflict reconstruction. Also joining us as a co-host today is the United Nations Department of Peace Operations. And we are indeed very honored to have the Under Secretary General for Peace Operations, Jean-Pierre Lacroix, joining us as well. And you will hear from him shortly. We also have a distinguished panel uh, who will be uh, discussing this important topic, and they will follow shortly as well. Today's discussion will inform a joint research report with the UAE on advancing the role of women in reconstruction, a key pillar of the 1325 Women, Peace, and Security Framework. That key pillar is post-conflict relief and recovery. We know that this critically important period, the transition from conflict to hope for sustainable peace and stability, economic opportunity, responsive governance and the building of democratic institutions, and yes, security sector reform, requires an inclusive approach for effective outcomes. In other words, it's the time to put in place the conditions for lasting peace. At Georgetown, we've been long committed to addressing this topic. Today, for example, we are engaged in significant research on the impact of women peacekeepers on the effectiveness of peacekeeping missions. The joint report uh, that we will be launching with the UAE uh, on advancing the role of women in reconstruction uh, will take place in a few weeks as part of the UN's observance of the 20th anniversary of the adoption of Security Council Resolution 1325 and certainly the call for a more accelerated implementation of 1325. We have just over a thousand participants joining us today for this event from over 120 countries, including many representatives from UN missions, embassies, and representatives of civil society organizations, including women peace builders who are working at the local level day in and day out for peace. And we welcome each and every one of you. Just a very quick logistical note. We have already received many pre-submitted questions from our audience members. And as a reminder, you will also have the opportunity to submit questions throughout the discussion. Submit your question using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and please include your name, organization, and to whom your question is addressed. Let me turn the microphone now over to our co-host, her Excellency Lana Nusebe, the UAE Ambassador and Permanent Representative to the United Nations. 
It has been a privilege to collaborate with her on this series and on previous discussions dedicated to women, peace, and security. I can say from firsthand knowledge and experience, she is effective, committed, and indomitable. And she has served as the co-chair of the Intergovernmental Negotiations on Security Sector Reform. She chairs the Friends of the Future of the UN, and she engages in many other key roles at the United Nations, in addition to being the permanent representative. Ambassador Nusebe, welcome. Very good to see you. Good to see you always, Milan. Good to see you and all your uh, excellent team, ambassadors, colleagues. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this fourth panel in our series with the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security on the role of women in post-conflict reconstruction. Today, we're turning to our final pillar of the reconstruction agenda, gender sensitive security sector reform. And I'm so pleased that the Department of Peace Operations has joined us as a co-host for this theme, bringing their field expertise to ground our discussions. I'm also honored that we have such compelling and diverse speakers to push us past broad normative statements and dig a little bit into the details of what we as stakeholders should do to enable security sector reform uh, to benefit women. I'd like to take this opportunity uh, personally to thank Ambassador Milan Revere for her stellar stewardship as our wonderful and engaging moderator throughout the series of discussions. You've really led us all uh, in a remarkable way, Milan. It's a testament to your leadership. So in our previous sessions, we've looked at the kinds of interventions that can move the dial on women's political participation, their livelihoods, and of course, their access to justice. Gender sensitizing the security sector is perhaps the thorniest topic of all, with tremendous tension about who controls armed power in the wake of a conflict. Yet, yet it is a sector that we in the UN community know to be essential for achieving both gender equality and of course, sustainable peace. During conflict, the security sector is perceived as a challenging and sometimes hostile space for women. Women can experience threats, violence, and a systemic exclusion from the political decision-making process. And the influences, um, and that can influence the course of the conflict uh, and undermine efforts to advance the role of women in communities, as well as the potential to achieve that more sustainable and just peace that we're all looking for post-conflict. So knowing the importance of strengthening the security sector towards achieving this lasting peace was really a critical factor in our decision to pursue a women peace and security training program for women peacekeepers through the Sheikha Fatima bint Mubarak Women Peace and Security Initi Initiative with UN Women. It's a partnership based in the UAE. And the program brings together women from Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, and aims to increase the number of women in the military and peacekeeping sector. And it's so far, I'm proud to say, equipped over 300 women with the necessary skills and tools to contribute to peacekeeping, conflict resolution, and all the aspects that go together towards building peaceful societies. So we're adding to that pipeline in this training program. By contrast, increasing women's representation in the security sector, as well as cultivating male allies who work for gender equality, is a really solid strategy in our view for dismantling gender-based power structures and norms uh, that contribute to this violence against women and the broader inequality that we see around the world. So accountability mechanisms really represent another powerful lever to empower women and build peace. And I think that's an area where, uh, if I can be frank, we have failed so far. The post-conflict period is accordingly critical in security uh, sector reform because its fluidity and shifting norms present a rare window to make and codify changes, potentially even large ones. But we all know from our work, we're all pragmatists, such change is easier said than done. So our hope in assembling this distinguished set of speakers is to mine their actual experience in promoting gender sensitive security sector reform in post-conflict situations. We're giving them the rather tall task of making specific recommendations on how the UN, member states and other stakeholders can be helpful and impactful in influencing the way reform unfolds and is implemented and the extent to which it actually empowers women or is it a box ticking exercise. 
what are the required policies, the management approaches, and the financing mechanisms that are needed? Combining the outcomes of our previous panels, we'd like to end our series with a concrete list of actions that member states and others can endorse and implement and hold ourselves accountable to. So for the UAE, hoping to serve as an elected member of the UN Security Council in 2022 and 2023, this list would be our North Star as we seek to live up to the vision of the landmark Resolution 1325 and the WPS agenda uh, writ large. An investment in women in the post-conflict period is an investment in our view in our collective lasting peace, stability and resiliency because we all know we are stronger when we are united. Let me finish by once again extending my sincere thanks to Ambassador Milan Revere and her team, her excellent team at the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security for this enduring partnership. We've learned so much from you. In the coming weeks, we'll invite you to join us for the launch of the joint UAE-Georgetown report and the UN Action Plan. The joint UAE-Georgetown publication will highlight major conclusions and recommendations from the panel discussions thus far and underlying research findings to advance and operationalize inclusive approaches to engaging in post-conflict contexts. While the UN Action Plan will outline 10 to 12 concrete priority actions and reforms that member states and UN agencies can undertake to ensure gender mainstreaming in post-conflict activities. So hopefully we can gather the goodwill and the support for those 10 to 12 policy recommendations. I thank you once again. And I'm really looking forward to our discussions and listening to all of your expertise. Thank you so much, Lana, Ambassador Nisebe, uh, for your extraordinary leadership on this issue and so many others. Uh, but also now for steering our discussion going forward today uh, with those excellent opening remarks. Uh, we're going to turn now to the Under Secretary General for Peace Operations, Jean-Pierre Lacroix. Prior to coming to this position, he was Director of UN International Organizations, Human Rights and Francophonie at the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He also served as Ambassador of France to Sweden and many other diplomatic posts. He has over 25 years of political and diplomatic experience with a very strong focus on multilateral organizations and certainly uh, programs at the United Nations. Uh, Mr. Undersecretary General, you honor us with your presence today and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ambassador Fervi, and thank you very much for having me for this uh, very important discussion. And uh, it's good to be with Ambassador Nusebe, Ambassador Raz, and uh, many other uh, colleagues, friends, and, uh, and supporters of, uh, of our action. And um, let me start by uh, saying that uh, uh, this year is the 20th anniversary year of Security Council Resolution 1325. Uh, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda is uh, absolutely top priorities of the uh, Secretary General's Agenda, Action for Peacekeeping. And, uh, and I'm really pleased to see that uh, so much attention is being given to this uh, very important area. I'm proud to say that uh, our department, the Department of Peace Operation, uh, has been and, and continues to be a long-standing supporter of the WPS Agenda including on promoting women's participation in political and peace processes, as well as on increasing the number of women at all levels in our UN peacekeeping operation. And this is really to us the two branches of the uh, WPS agenda and of obviously gender responsive uh, security sector reform is an area that is directly linked to these two priorities and needless to say they are also linked to the larger goal of achieving gender equality and let me say that uh, <clears throat> we view the advancements of the um, WPS agenda as a whole but uh, more specifically this critical issue of gender responsive SSR as an issue of effectiveness that is to say the more uh, we uh, take that agenda forward and I think the, the more uh, we're likely to achieve our goal uh, in a way uh, that is uh, not only effective but also sustainable. Um, so um, uh, I will uh, focus on four areas uh, uh, in uh, this intervention. I will 
first begin with the normative frameworks and guidance. I will then turn to a few examples of our field work, then to the challenges that we're facing. And finally, I will mention a few conditions which we believe uh, would be needed to achieve further progress in our efforts. So let me start first uh, with the area of normative framework of gui and guidance. Uh, I think it's fair to say that much has been accomplished on gender responsive SSR since the uh, adoption of resolution 2013-25. Normative frameworks have been established, including through uh, uh, Security Council resolution 2151 on SSR and six out of the 11 resolutions on women, peace and security include explicit provisions on SSR. So you see that this is an area that is definitely uh, included as an important uh, priority uh, within the broader context of uh, SSR. Further to that, system-wide guidance on gender provision, on gender responsive SSR has been developed. Uh, just recently, our department DPO has published policy recommendations on assisting security forces during COVID-19, equally applying a gender responsive approach. That is to say, we are also paying attention to mainstreaming uh, the uh, gender agenda uh, in our different policies uh, related to the sec security sector, particularly in this uh, COVID-19 context. Um, I would like to highlight that the strategic partnerships that we have forged in this area are absolutely of critical importance. We have a number of very important partnership with member states. I think it's uh, uh, heartening to see the uh, engagement of uh, the UAE uh, in, in this very important area. And, uh, and I also believe that the group of friends of uh, SSR security sector reform, which just last year facilitated a, a round table with the African Union and women leaders on gender parity is also uh, a, a good example of uh, uh, this uh, very important uh, uh, um, commonality and, and of purpose and, and, uh, and uh, collective uh, action. So I, I think uh, all these collective efforts have already provided timely direction and guidance to our work on gender and SSR. Obviously, we need to continue uh, with this partnership to actually uh, look forward to enhancing and further strengthening these uh, very important partnership. Um, let me then turn to a few examples of our work in the field. Uh, as I said, I mean, women's full, equal, and meaningful participation in national security sectors reform is one of the UN and one of our uh, highest priorities in the area of SSR. We pursue an inclusive approach to SSR assistance across the, spe the spectrum of peacemaking, peacekeeping, peacebuilding, and development. And we have, daily, as you know, dedicated teams in uh, countries such as the Central African Republic, the DR Congo, Libya, Mali, Somalia, South Sudan, the Gambia and Yemen, as well as in regional offices uh, such as uh, UNOAU, our office in Addis Abeba, as well as uh, UNOMAS, uh, UNOWAS, uh, the uh, UN office in, uh, for Western Africa based in uh, Dakar, Senegal. So uh, again, a few concrete examples of the impact that we have achieved in this area in some of, at least some of our peace operation. In the Central African Republic, uh, MINUSCA has supported national security sector institutions to work towards ultimately reaching the 35% a 35 quota for women as set by the country's equality law. Um, Gender sensitive recruitment enabled the national police to reach a representation of women at over 31%, which I believe is very significant. And in their last selection, the, international, the internal security forces, the correction services, and the Central African Armed Defense Forces met their recruitment targets for women with 26%, 15%, and 10% respectively. So even though a long way remains to go, I believe that uh, the progress that has already been achieved in that particular uh, situation is quite remarkable and indeed commendable because uh, this is really uh, the uh, result of, uh, of a collective effort. Um, in addition, in further support of these efforts, MINUSCA has prepared a compendium of women in uniform 
listing women experts in the defense and security sector to distribute to communities and, and encourage women to pursue careers in the national security services. And the, the companion really is important because it gives um, uh, an overview and a detailed listing of uh, the kind of competences that are expected, uh, including from women, to, for them to apply uh, to different careers in the in the defense and security sector se uh, sectors, and this is, I believe, uh, uh, one important element in our efforts to to encourage and incentivize women to join these uh, this field. In Mali, the Security Council, in Resolution 2531, mandated MINUSMA, and I quote, to assist the Malian authorities in, in ensuring the full, effective, and meaningful participation involvement and representation of women at all levels in the implementation of the, the, the peace agreement, including the security sector reform. So then again, a specific ref, uh, ref, reference in a situation-based resolution of the Security Council to SSR and uh, the importance of having a gender perspective in these area. So against this backdrop and amidst the ongoing political crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, MINUSMA has scaled up its efforts to build the capacities of security institutions in order to respond to all forms of violence against women, youth, and girls. And this is a very good example which illustrates our support that enables security institutions to become more gender responsive. A milestone, I believe, has been reached by successfully supporting the establishment of a vetting mechanism that will hopefully prevent perpetrators of sexual violence from joining the Malian army. Here, I, I would also like to say that uh, um, it's important to have in mind that the security sector reform is highly political. Um, these are really uh, uh, part of, uh, of a key uh, decisions that really frame the future of a country. And therefore, I think it's very important to uh, connect uh, our efforts uh, towards uh, uh, inclusive and uh, gender sensitive uh, security sector reforms to our more, our broader efforts to associate more women in uh, political efforts, political agreement, and uh, the uh, governing structures and decision making structure at the highest political level that will eventually have to implement all this decision because we need women to be involved in the critical decision uh, on SSR and that is uh, only at the political level. Let me now turn to challenges. Um, the, um, well, let me, let me begin by saying that uh, um, Earlier this year, we, we've had uh, extensive consultation with women leaders, ex-combatants and security officers. As a result of that, DPO launched a report on strengthening gender responsive DDR and SSR in peace operation. And that report identified challenges to meet uh, our action for peacekeeping commitments on women, peace and security. Uh, so, and that report outlines that, uh, which would not necessarily come as a surprise to us that security sectors in many countries continue to be largely dominated by men and systematically, not necessarily willingly, I mean, in some cases willingly, in some cases uh, inadvertently maybe, but systematically uh, in most cases continue, continue to exclude and discriminate against women. And such exclusion has severely impacted the state's capacities to effectively prevent conflicts respond to the security needs of all members of their population, women, boys, and girls, and in the end, contribute to international peace and security. The report also notes that we are operating in an increasingly complex environment marked by limited resources, donor fatigue, and stalled peace processes. In some contexts, the democratic control of the security forces appears to be contracting rather than expanding allowing for an increasing politicization of security officers. So these poses obviously several challenges to implementing the women, peace and security agenda. But uh, I think we should not be deterred by these challenges. And uh, this is where I'm coming to the uh, couple of conditions which I believe are and, and objectives that are 
which I believe are essential to, to, uh, to our further efforts. Um, first, national leadership and commitment. Barriers to women's inclusion are often deeply embedded in security institutions, culture, and cannot be resolved only by training and equipping solutions. It's much broader than that. And therefore, strong national leadership is required to undertake the necessary actions, which include establishing gender parity quotas, assessing barriers to women's inclusion, and developing gender responsive SSR strategies to address them. And here, I just would like to add that. Um, you know, we're making a lot of efforts to have more women in, particularly in our uniform uh, personnel. And uh, we are, I think, successful in these efforts. We, we've had, uh, uh, you know, we, 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 we went beyond our uh, targets, you know, in terms of percentage uh, uh, in most, uh, actually uh, all but one uh, areas, the, the only areas in which we are slightly behind our objectives is in the military formed units, which I believe is because of the uh, resource that is not enough uh, for, uh, for peacekeeping to, to uh, and the, the resources in, in national states, which, which are not enough to, to help us meet our goal. But uh, we've significantly increased the proportion of women in a police officer, formed police unit, military observer, staff officers. And uh, what is important to, to highlight is that our member states are now aware that we need uh, more women in peacekeeping. And uh, they're also aware uh, of the reason why we need uh, that. Uh, the, the, I think there's a much greater awareness that in the end, this is helping our uh, peace efforts. This is helping us uh, to, be, to become more effective. And I also believe that as a result of that, uh, we are incentivizing uh, many member states to include more women in their own armed and security forces, uh, if only for the purpose of uh, uh, serving peacekeeping, but also I believe because there is a greater awareness that uh, this would be of benefit to them as well. I would also add that uh, uh, many of our female colleagues uh, in the military and the police uh, ultimately will return to their countries and I believe that they will bring with them uh, a lot of experience which eventually be of benefit to their uh, security and armed services and ultimately to their home countries. Anyway, uh, turning to the second condition which I believe is uh, also very important. Uh, peace, uh, the Department of Peace Operation is committed to ensuring that the UN provides the effective and coherent assistance to countries and partners engaged in gender responsive SSR. And I'm very pleased to announce uh, our department's intention to review the United Nations SSR guidance note from 2012, so almost uh, eight years ago, uh, in order to take into account new women peace and security resolutions, include the lessons that we have learned uh, in the field and the best practices that we've accumulated in the last eight years. It was long overdue and I'm glad to uh, announce that now we will, uh, as I said, update uh, and profoundly revisit uh, this UN SSR guidance. Um, third, and I think very important as well, third conditions, uh, the availability of data. Um, despite considerable investments, there is still uh, insufficient data on the proportion and status of women in national security services around the world. And this in those serious efforts to track progress and promote accountability of national security sectors toward gender equality norms. I believe it also um, hinders our effort to exactly understand uh, or to understand more precisely what are the barriers uh, that affect uh, the uh, um, inclusion of women in, in security and, and military forces and, and uh, where uh, the emphasis should be put in, uh, in, in the future. In partnership with expert organizations, I believe that consideration should be given to establishing a mechanism that we consolidate data and report on progress and challenges in this area. So in other words, more data, a more specific and detailed knowledge of what the situation is in national security and armed forces around the world. The fourth condition is predictable funding. And this is of course a, a very uh, tricky and challenging area. There is an enormous gap between the expectations 
established by the UN peace and security resolutions and the available resources. The political resources, the technical resources, and more, more importantly, the financial resources. Um, so, uh, you know, in this context, I would like to highlight that uh, uh, we, uh, I think most of the efforts that we're undertaking on uh, uh, SSR and including our effort to have a, a, a gender uh, uh, sensitive and, and uh, an inclusive SSR policy are funded by extra budgetary resources. So these uh, resources are absolutely key for the implementation of this agenda. And uh, obviously we uh, appreciate as a, as a department the uh, support that many member states are providing to us in this regard. But uh, uh, this is obviously something that I would like to emphasize and emphasize uh, again, in connection with that, the importance of uh, partnerships uh, uh, to which I was alluding uh, earlier in my uh, intervention. Finally, another condition which I believe is equally very important, it's women's leadership. Although leadership positions in most security sectors are traditionally occupied by men, we're seeing an increase of women in leadership positions, including ministers of defense, chiefs of staff of armed forces, inspector general of police, and this is a remarkable advancement, and this really presents an opportunity. Women in uniform, especially those in leadership position, have overcome many obstacles to access positions of power. We should support efforts to bring these women together to exchange their experiences, network, and influence the global agenda on SSR. And here, I would like to uh, mention our efforts, the DPO efforts to uh, appoint uh, women in senior leadership position, both in the police uh, and in the military. We currently have uh, um, one uh, female force commander. Uh, we have three uh, um, deputy force commander. Uh, we have an increasingly uh, important number of uh, female police commissioner or deputy police commissioner, and uh, we intend to continue appointing more women to this important position. And I would also like to add that uh, it's important to promote role models. Uh, the UN has awarded uh, this year and the previous year, uh, three women um, you know, military officers serving in our mission as a you know, military gender advocate of the year. I don't know if that, that was the exact title, but the point is that it's important to highlight the role of those uh, fantastic women in our peace operation and the difference they make and, and also um, uh, using their example as, uh, as, as, a, as, an, as an incentive for, for women uh, to understand the, uh, the, the opportunities that exist in, in uh, uh, service in, in security and, and military uh, uh, services and particularly in uh, the context of peacekeeping operations. So um, I will stop here, of course, there is a lot of stake. I hope that we can jointly continue to champion these and other initiatives that support the women, peace and security agenda and, and promote gender equality. Uh, thank you again for inviting me. I look forward to your discussion. And um, thank you again, uh, Ambassador Verfia, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Under Secretary General Lacroix. And uh, that was a very forthright and fulsome uh, uh, pr presentation on the status of uh, this issue vis-a-vis uh, -vis peace operations. I uh, was particularly grateful to hear your mention of the challenges, the importance of national leadership uh, on this issue, the uh, fact that you're going to be undertaking a, a review of the UN SSR guidance uh, on the gender lens piece. Uh, again, the importance of data, it is stressed in so many presentations. I hope that uh, not just in this area, but that we do pay more attention across the board uh, to the importance of data uh, resources. And then again, uh, your, your views on the uh, support and promotion of women's leadership and what that represents. Uh, and I think we were all uh, really pleased to hear some of those examples of um, uh, the gender perspective that's being applied at the local level in peace operations. Uh, so thank you for all of that. You certainly have uh, a lot of work uh, and we're grateful for your leadership in this, in this role. I'm gonna turn now to our distinguished panel. 
Uh, we're starting with Ambassador uh, Ed Laraz, Afghanistan's ambassador to the United Nations, the first woman uh, to hold this position. Uh, she started her career with the UN assistance mission in Afghanistan, UNAMA, and she has over 11 years of extensive experience in the fields of political uh, and economic analysis, policy development, communications, and governance, including uh, as the first female deputy spokesperson and director of communications for then President Karzai, the president of Afghanistan at the time, and as deputy foreign minister for economic cooperation. So Ambassador Raz, it's always a, a joy uh, to be with you and to get your uh, perspective on this key issue as well. Um, all eyes are in Afghanistan in many ways these days, in particular on the talks that are going on in Doha. Uh, one of the things that Afghanistan uh, has done uh, in terms of the security sector reform uh, that we're discussing uh, is really trying to make its armed forces and police more inclusive. Uh, I wonder what difference uh, you see this female participation in particular uh, has made. Uh, what have the challenges been? Because I know it's not been easy. Um, and, and perhaps you could add to that um, how SSR contributes to advancing women, peace, and security at all levels of post-conflict recovery, uh, something that is very key um, in your country. Um, thank you for the question, uh, Ambassador Milan, and thank you for inviting me uh, to this panel today. Um, I would like to thank Lana as well for being an incredible champion of um, the Women, Peace, and Security agenda here at the UN and beyond, and of course, UA's uh, support uh, for Afghanistan. And also let me thank USG uh, Lakwa for uh, his incredible uh, briefing and, and uh, information that he shared with us today. Um, today are uh, approximately 5,200 women are serving in the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces. While this represents a significant progress, uh, more work is absolutely needed to reach our targets. For example, our current goal is to achieve about 5% of women in the national police force, but today women are um, about 2.8% of the workforce. This is the highest level in 18 years, and it is the result of, uh, as you said, a significant amount of work that has been done uh, in last 18 years. But we do need to continue to do more than that. Uh, let me start by explaining why the government, under the leadership of His Excellency President Ghani, is continuously working to increase these numbers and then address why this is a tough challenge for us. First, we do believe that for the security forces, especially the police, the effective a protection of women's rights and respond to the challenges faced by Afghan women, there must be a higher number of female officers. And of course, for all the great reasons that we have been discussing uh, through literatures, through experiences that we have um, globally. For us, um, this means increasing female personnel. Uh, we will increase the level of trust uh, that would be built within the security forces, especially in a country that we're still struggling uh, with security challenges and it's a traditional society. So uh, in a lot of these places, our security forces have strongly said they do need women to be with them, to accompany them in and, and, and the rule of law, as well as in the defense uh, front uh, too. Um, the second reason is that uh, female officers have played a very significant role as advocates for change uh, within the bureaucratic structure of our security uh, forces. And that includes um, actually three entities. It's the police, it's the defense, and it's our intelligence wing, which is the Ash uh, Afghanistan national, um, uh, and the, and they call it the um, security sector, it's, it's the intelligence wing uh, that uh, we have. And by having women in these sectors, uh, we have seen a very institutional change, uh, which um, 
these women already have started to become a very strong advocate uh, for, uh, for inclusion of women uh, bringing to the leadership and uh, breaking the barriers uh, that does exist in a traditional society uh, like Afghanistan. Uh, right now, for the first time, we have uh, a woman uh, deputy minister at the Ministry of Interior, Ms. Husna Jalil, and she is uh, doing the policy work. And at the same time, we also have a deputy um, Minister at the Defense Sector, uh, Minister of Def uh, Deputy uh, Minister of Defense, and uh, she is also an incredible young woman. And uh, both of them, not only that they do their job excellent, and they also have been uh, a uh, an symbol for a lot of younger generation within the country to look up to to them and then uh, see that uh, exactly this is what they could be, and uh, and and there is no barrier uh, traditionally or by the leadership of the country as well. And, and in the third reason, I think, as I said uh, earlier, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the new Afghanistan. It's the, the Afghanistan that we want um, to, to build further. Uh, this is the Afghanistan where uh, youth, women uh, would be able and should see themselves as a part of um, the, the reconstruction, as part of uh, building a more uh, sustainable institution and especially on the security uh, side as well. And as you said, it's, it's um, what uh, you highlighted, what would be the challenges or what, are the, what is the tough road we had ahead and we're still having it. And, and it's, we're not, we're not the only country. It's not really a new um, discussion and debate uh, either uh, here at the UN or outside of the UN and any other country. Security sector has been always a very challenging field for a lot of women and every part of the world to really join. So Afghanistan it has not been immune to that. And it got even more uh, complex when I, in, in our um, 40 years of struggle um, to, to, to build uh, uh, the, the, the country that it is today in the civil war where the educational institutions were uh, destroyed. And most importantly, our security sector was absolutely destroyed. And we started from from, from scratch. And at the time when we started, we had single women in the security sector. So bringing that and making it uh, to a level where it is today, it does seem a very significant uh, road that we have passed, but it's definitely not enough. Um, there are still barriers uh, like in any other country um, that uh, women do feel harassment and, and at, at the work. Uh, and then there are not the necessary resources available that it should be in. Sometimes it's very simple and we, we don't even think about it. It's the uniform uh, because for a traditional country, the type of uniform it was initially prepared for security sector, uh, it, it really did not um, uh, fulfill to some of the women, so we had to adjust that one. The resources within uh, within the bases where uh, or there within the workforce. So it's it started from there, and where we are, uh, we have seen a tremendous progress. There is a lot of advocacy that's going on uh, as well because uh, we have to change the mentality from bottom up. Yes, there is a very strong leadership support, as uh, all of you know, uh, where uh, the commitment of the government is, where we see that uh, why it is important for Afghan women to be part of our uh, national and uh, defense security forces. But there is a lot still struggle within families to, to accept that if uh, their daughters are uh, trying to pursue a career in this field. And, and I think uh, we don't have to have a lot of argument to say why it's good, why it should be there. And I think uh, we are a very lucky nation in a sense that our leadership does not e didn't need that conviction to be convinced because it really came from top down that this change must happen. And uh, in, in, in it's our bottom up challenge that we are still uh, trying uh, to address. And it's gonna take time because uh, the education level needs to change, the, the awareness and the information, uh, the, the type of um, confidence that the family needs to build uh, within, within their household. And, and that's going to take time, but for us, um, it's, um, we, we are on the right track. 
but not where we should be. Uh, that I have to uh, make the acknowledgement. We are, we're still struggling with the type of uh, needed training that they need to have, both men and women. It's not only specifically to women. As you may know, our security forces are still receiving support from the international community. And there are good initiatives that has been undergone and countries have, uh, step, um, have taken the step forward to um, provide training for our female police officers as well, female in the security sector, and that goes um, both to defense and, 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 and police. Uh, UEA is one of the examples, and, and it was an incredible moment that in my uh, one of uh, recent visits, I, I had to come across, I met those women in uniform, uh, and it was in, very, very emotional. Um, Turkey has also done an excellent work in this regard. Uh, the same thing in UK, we have uh, female cadets who are going for training. So it's a, it's a long journey. Uh, it's a very tough journey. Um, and uh, the positive side of the, the, this, this, this journey is uh, we are now at the level that we don't, we are not having struggle with the leadership to convince them that they need to do it. The, the part that it's still a struggling part, it is that we are still working within the communities, within the society, within uh, households and families, and, 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 and there are various campaigns we have led by the government and civil society to bring greater awareness uh, why it is important, why they must be uh, part of um, our, our, our uh, defense forces, part of our uh, uh, rule of law and law and order. So um, these are these are the, the very tough challenges and the difficult ch challenges we have, but it's it's not stopping us uh, by any uh, by any means. I'm going well, to thank you. because I know we have other panelists. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And uh, you know uh, the difficulties these obstacles pose. Uh, are not just uh, there in terms of cultural and mm -hmm. attitudes and mindsets. Uh, it does affect rather significantly in, in terms of women's participation uh, in policing and armed forces, but it's also an issue in so many other areas where women are trying to take uh, their equal place. Uh, so thank you for that perspective. We're gonna turn now to um, Commander Seema Dondia She's the former commander of the first all-female formed police unit in Liberia, uh, where she led a unit of over 100 uniformed women uh, to ensure post-conflict stability. Uh, the example of women, <clears throat> female soldiers, encouraged local Liberian women to join uh, the police force. They had quite an impact in that respect. And her efforts also supported the campaign to end sexual violence. Um, in Liberia. Earlier, she was the commander of the world's first all-female uh, paramilitary in India and currently serves as Deputy Inspector General of the Central Reserve Police Force uh, in India. So Commander Dondia, it's really uh, wonderful to have you with us as well. Um, as I just said, you headed up um, the UN's first all-women police unit. Uh, that was dispatched to Liberia in 2007. Uh, the positive impact created by you and your team, uh, by any definition and by any assessment all these years later, uh, left a lasting legacy uh, in Liberia. Given your experience there and beyond, what difference do you think uh, the all-female unit made um, in Liberia? And what does it tell us about future engagement. Good evening, ma'am. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to this uh, panel discussion. And uh, the subject that is very dear to me. When I landed there in Liberia, the situation was very bad. The country had faced uh, civil wars and there were victims of uh, gender violence. There were victims of domestic violence. The confidence of the young girls and females were all shattered. They were not able to come up and speak about their problems and all. So when I had gone there for a recce visit, I could understand as to what sort of uh, things or what sort of actions are required from our side. Uh, the organization to which I belong has a motto. That is to serve humanity through sensitive policing. So when we landed there in Liberia, so I had this in, in back of my mind that we are going to be very sensitive towards the problems that the young Liberian girls and females were you know, 
uh, were seeing, were facing. And so then we uh, started to uh, work beyond uh, our, uh, we started working beyond and above our mandated job. Our mandate was to give protection uh, uh, to, uh, to the UN uh, establishments, to the UN uh, 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 unfolds and all. But we thought that uh, merely doing our job that is, uh, that is laid down for us will not solve the purpose because all, all of us wanted a, a sort of a sustainable peace to exist there, to, uh, I mean, uh, what we were striving for sustainable peace there. So uh, we thought that we will work beyond and above our mandated job. So we started uh, building uh, 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 confidence amongst the local population. So we, we were deployed for uh, night patrolling, carried out search and raid uh, operations and were seen on streets of Monrovia. We were in our uniform carrying all sorts of equipments and weapons with us. So the community, especially the young girls, the victims, they felt assured that uh, they were seeing it for the first time that the female police officers are there. They are there to guard us. They are there to protect us. So they were they felt assured uh, by our presence. And uh, we were all good listeners. We listened to them, you know, we, we and our body language, uh, our mannerism were all conducive for a victim to open up. So we were good listeners and we used to listen to their problems. As a result, the victims started opening up. They started telling us uh, the problems that we, they, they were facing, they were undergoing. And by our, uh, you know, intervention, the reporting in crime uh, increased. You know, the, the women, the victims started coming forward and telling, and, uh, you know, started registering their complaints in the police station and all. So, um, and we visited their police uh, training academy and counseled the young female recruits as well. You know, when we landed there in Liberia, there were hardly few female officers in their la uh, national uh, Liberian uh, uh, police. But uh, when we started going to their uh, training academies, police training academies, we started counseling them. We started mentoring them. So the, the girls got inspired and they started uh, joining their own uh, national uh, police force. We uh, started uh, building uh, uh, friendship with them in order to build uh, the trust. So we started uh, celebrating all sorts of festivals with them. We used to invite those uh, girls to our camp and we used to celebrate uh, their festivals, our festivals, so that the, the trust is built between uh, the communities. And uh, as a result, what happened to my, my girls, they became role models for the Liberian girls. And we, uh, you know, the, the, we, we became as a sort of role models and we, they, they even started calling us as Indian sisters. So wherever they needed us, they wanted us, we were all there, you know, with all our ears open, our body language, our mannerism, we were all receptive, we were receptive to their ideas, we were receptive to their complaints. So we started uh, registering uh, uh, their problems and all, and we started, uh, we tried to help them. So the confidence was built, the trust was uh, built, and uh, the communities, uh, they started interacting with us. And the basic key uh, to all this uh, solu uh, problem is, I think, communication. Communication is a key uh, factor to, uh, to solve all these uh, conflict, uh, you know, ridden uh, problems and all. I mean, post-conflict ridden problem. Communication is the basic uh, thing that is required between the security sector and uh, between the communities that we are interacting. We are uh, performing our duties where, wherever we are performing our duties. So uh, we devoted our personal time and resources because of that, Liberian girls' confidence and esteem grew manifold. They, st they, were, they started feeling confident of uh, themselves. So they, start, uh, they had taken the charge of their own lives. So we, we started uh, community camps, medical checkup camps, and we, uh, we, and, uh, there was a, uh, we started giving them clean drinking water. So as a result, what happened is the rates of exploitation and sexual abuse uh, are, uh, were dropped, you know, uh, when we started intervening. In their day-to-day -day life, the uh, the rate of uh, uh, sexual exploitation and sexual abuse dropped, and more uh, and more numbers of girls started enrolling in schools. I mean, they, earlier they were not going to the schools, but after our intervention and our, our, all of our efforts, the girls the, they started uh, enrolling themselves in schools. We taught them the self-defense, the first aid techniques, so so that they are able to break uh, break free from their bo uh, bonds. So community programs brought various sections of the community together, instilling a sense of unity, harmony, harmony and togetherness. So what I feel now after, uh, you know, 13, uh, 14 years, the difference that we made in the society was tremendous. 
they made a huge difference you know there was a reduction in number of poverty related petty crimes because we were there we were there to protect them we were there to counsel them we were there to mentor uh, them and then uh, there was an increase in the number of women in the security sector their own girls started uh, coming forward and they joined their own uh, liberian national police and then our presence also inspired community pride pride in the area and there was a decrease in crime through stronger uh, stronger community participating so i think that is all we did besides our mandated job we we tried to outreach to the uh, uh, try to uh, we we adopted the communities we started communicating with them we started inviting them to our camps we we started mentoring them we started training them we started counseling them and it made a lot of difference and it was all because of our personal time and resource i mean we utilized our own personal time and resources it was not mandated so that is all we did for the for the communities there in liberia so I, uh, this is all i could say right now What well it's quite a bit it's quite a bit commander uh and we thank you for for that and for uh, your reflections on what happened i know that president uh uh Sirleaf has said many times that it was the inspiration of seeing the police unit uh that you headed up uh that sent many many uh women into policing as a career option uh when given the culture the attitudes etc that may never have happened uh and she thought it had significant impact uh so uh thank you for that we're going to turn now to Dr Sabrina Kareem who's a noted authority in this area that we're discussing. Uh she's the hardest family assistant professor at Cornell University and the author of Equal Opportunity Peacekeeping: Women, Peace and Security in Post-Conflict Countries. A uh, title that's right on to this discussion. Uh she also did uh an in-country eight country assessment of women's barriers and opportunities in joining the military. Uh policing and and you uh, peacekeeping missions with support from the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance and is currently working on her next book When Peace Makes States How International Security uh, How International Security Sector Assistance Shapes Post-Conflict State Building uh so with all of that uh effort on your part over the years uh Dr uh Kareem uh tell us why is SSR why is security sector reform a critical step in post conflict transition to peace how, and how does uh the gender sensitive uh SSR sustain successful transitions because that is at the heart of what we're discussing today Great. Thank you so much uh to Ambassador Revere as well as Georgetown and uh the UAE Permanent Mission for hosting this fantastic event. It's a privilege and an honor to be a part of this panel with such distinguished speakers and uh everything that uh the previous speakers have said really resonate with the research that I've done on this topic. And so that's what I'll speak about today. Um and so I'll I'll begin with the first question. uh with regards to to security sector reform in general in terms of how that affects sustainable peace um and the the research here really shows that um security sector reform is imperative for a, a number of reasons so first of all it's really important because what it does is it, it boosts this the capacity of the state to be able to enforce the peace agreement So if if a country that has undergone civil war does not have a security force a professionalized security force uh then there's no way to really enforce that peace agreement. So that's that's really kind of the the first building block. And um, the second building block that I think is important with what security sector reform does is that it provides democratic <laughs> governance. So you have this twin issue of wanting to create a security force that's strong but not but that is also contained and under control uh by civilians and that's accountable transparent um so that the security force itself which was a, a great source of mistrust during the conflict is not seen in the same way uh in the post conflict period. And so security sector reform really uh is tasked to help with these two elements of so building capacity and then ensuring civilian control. The third thing that security sector reform does is that it it makes the security forces much more representative of the population. And this is where the the 
the integration of women or the inclusion of women um, comes in. Now, um, the Undersecretary General mentioned the fantastic job that the peacekeepers have done in the Central African Republic with regards to integrating women into the police force, the uh, armed forces, etc. And that would not be possible without the peacekeeping mission involvement, so without third party involvement. So we can imagine that a number of reforms that are implemented uh, through the security sector reform framework are a result of having uh, UN peacekeepers as a result of having international third party involvement to ensure that these reforms actually are enacted. Uh, in, in countries where we don't have that kind of pre presence, you, you probably wouldn't see reforms related to women or reforms related to gender. So in an interesting kind of way, conflict and especially international involvement during conflict opens the door for the rebuilding of different types of institutions, especially when it comes to um, you know, making the, the, reform, uh, the security forces more representative, et cetera, of the population. Um, the, the second thing that security sector reform does, and then I'll get to the gender part, um, is that the, one of the unfortunate consequences of conflict is that it creates a, a large number of people that become experts in the use of violence. So we have a lot more people that know how to use violence, that are willing to use violence. And so what do you do with these people uh, after the conflict is over? And security sector reform provides a framework for uh, either integrating some of these people back into the security forces under something that's called power sharing agreements, which is when uh, the different sides come together to negotiate a peace agreement and they decide that the different sides want to share power. And so then they negotiate that, you know, eat, that means that for the security forces, if there's power sharing agreements, that some people that were involved in the conflict are integrated back into the security forces. Now, security sector reform ensures that even if that happens, there's still control over those people. There is democratic governance of the security forces to ensure that those people are not um, uh, taking advantage of, of their reincorporation in the security forces. Now, when they're not incorporated, so in, in some instances, uh, you know, the UN and, and the US, some, kind of, some third party actors are not allowed to, to train security forces that have people that have violated human rights. Um, but that means they're still out there. And so um, that's when disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration becomes very important. Uh, because otherwise you still have these people that are violence experts still in the country. So if that process is not complete, uh, com then you still have these people that have not been reintegrated into society. Okay, so I mentioned that third parties, especially UN peacekeeping, is integral for a, uh, women's inclusion in the, in the domestic security forces. They make it possible for that to happen, and some of my research has shown that. Um, and there are three, re I mean, there's many reasons, as the pre previous um, panelists have spoken about, uh, given many examples about why this is important. And I'll just kind of mention the, th the kind of in a, in a structured form, three reasons why it's important. So first, women in the security forces make the security forces in particular uh, police and armed forces accessible to women in the community, particularly in societies that where there is a, a more of a norm against women interacting with men. So if there are no women in the security forces and, and then we live in a society where it's not acceptable for women to, to interact with, with men, who do they go to? So that allows, it, it makes it more accessible. Second, women's security issues are taken more seriously when you have uh, women in the security forces because we do have more of a focus on domestic violence, sexual violence. Oftentimes women are included by the, through the creation of new institutions in the security force. So you have the creation of a sexual violence unit, for example, or a gender-based violence unit within the police force and women get integrated through that. So you, you have more of a focus on women's security issues. Um, and then finally, with respect to gender, um, when the security forces value conflict resolution, communi communication skills, and even empathy, as actually the commander mentioned, these kinds of values make it more effective in its job, in their job. So they're better able to interact with community members if they have these skills like conflict resolution communication, um, and they're less likely to engage in abusive behavior themselves. And so the gender component is just as important as the women component. It's women plus men and women who have these values that make uh, security forces more uh, friendly to and, and, and uh, friendly towards sustainable peace. 
Um, the last thing I'll say on this point is that, um, so I have the privilege to work with on the LC initiative and um, the uh, and DCAF on developing the measuring opportunities for women in peace operations barrier assessment methodology, um, where we have uncovered 10 different barriers for women's uh, peace, meaningful participation in peacekeeping operations and have been um, uh, testing out the, the barriers in different countries. And so we have uh, interviewed through surveys over 2,000 personnel, men and women, to try to uncover uh, for each specific country which barriers are most salient. Um, and so I'd be happy to talk more about that. Um, and we think that this is very important because just because women are included in the security forces doesn't mean that that leads to their meaningful participation. They have to be given the opportunities and empowered to be able to do their job in order for all of these um, positive benefits to be, to be seen. So thank you. Well, thank you for that overview, and you're exactly right. Uh, inclusion is not enough uh, for meaningful participation, uh, which is what matters in the end. Um, we are in a constant battle with the clock as we are right now because we're running behind, uh, but I want to get through one quick round with our panel uh, because you are also distinguished in your area of expertise. Uh, so I'm going to plead with you to make your responses uh, much shorter so that we uh, don't go over significantly. Um, and I'm going to turn to Ambassador Roz, and, and it's a perfect segue uh, from Dr. Kareem because she mentioned that uh, inclusion isn't enough, meaningful participation needs to go hand in hand with that. Uh, and that's why these peace talks, among other reasons, are so important that are going on uh, between Afghans and, and the Taliban. Uh, tell us very quickly, if you can, why the international community uh, can play an important role now in ensuring that the gains that Afghan women have made are not eroded and pushed back, including those gains in the security sector. Thank you. I, I think I'm, I'm going to um, be really brief and uh, because I don't even have to explain the reasons why. It's, a, it's a, such a good segue because the good reasons have been already mentioned that why women needs to be at the forefront of every aspect, especially uh, the discussion is uh, specifically in the security sector. Uh, for uh, us, for Afghanistan, for the government and the people of Afghanistan, I wanted to put it on, on the record that we want peace. And, uh, and we do want to have an end to conflict. The start of the intra-Afghan negotiation, we take it as a really good sign for uh, the very first step taken uh, in this regard. And we are extremely grateful for the nation and the countries who have helped us this far to facilitate the talks, to initiate the talk and the start of it and the ho uh, hosting uh, these talks. But of course, there are uh, various challenges and one of, um, and like in many other peace talks, but for us, it's really unique for the talk, uh, the peace talks uh, of uh, the Afghan peace talks. It's that they, the protection in, uh, and uh, of the gains of the last 19 years and as well as progressing and going further. And, uh, and if I speak in the, in the, security sector, if I uh, speak very frankly. Uh, we do know, and I think uh, it's not really new to a lot of us here at, at this conversation that we have and those who have been engaged in the talks, uh, including our UN colleagues and the recent briefing that was uh, made by SRSG Dabra, that uh, with the Afghan peace talks, Taliban have not really expressed their willingness yet uh, in the change in their position, where do they see women in the future of Afghanistan? Because uh, that definition for them is still gray and they haven't uh, come to explain it yet very clearly. Uh, for us, I think starting basically what we want is the protection of Afghan women's right according to the constitution. Because I always say, look, uh, the, the fight of us being in the security sector or being in the government or outside of government or in the private sector, these are, um, now there is that ability and strength among Afghan women to come forward and defend and argue in reason. But if the constitutional rights are compromised, because there are this conversation that the constitution will be amended, but we know there is a huge difference of definition of what rights of women would be according to what we believe in the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan believes and what the Taliban have so far expressed. So there is no, um, 
uh, there shouldn't be any doubt why the international community um, uh, will be an important partner because you have so many of the examples in front of uh, in front of you and in front of all of us uh, what um, dr karim just mentioned look the reform in the security sector where women are uh, at, at the at the, are part of it for a traditional society like afghanistan is just going to help a, the representation, as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Karim. B, the implementation of the peace agreement, which is the extremely important element that we know it's going to be a challenge for us. And, and there will be a vacuum of um, the absence of the international uh, forces that are starting to leave already Afghanistan. So we do need to, to have a diverse security force, which uh, it's already excellent in the region that we have in terms of the ability and the capacity, but it's not as diverse as it should be just because of the absence of uh, Afghan women. And it's not only the Afghan women, and I think as you may know, Afghanistan, it's a very diverse society. We have ethnic minorities. So they, uh, and, and as you mentioned, Dr. Karim, that the security force is the first phase of, of, of uh, a country that, um, that it, it represents the, the or presents the equal representation of the nation. And, and, and there is all, also very gray areas where Taliban have the definition of uh, how minorities should see themselves in the new in the in Afghanistan post peace scenario. So the support and the engagement of the international community is extremely important. Yes, we highly emphasize an, on Afghan-led and Afghan-owned, but that does not really mean that um, it should it should be a, a compromised call by the international community to say that, look, um, this is what we decide. Our voice is very clear. The Republic's voice is really clear. We do not want to compromise. We do not want to compromise what we have uh, made an achievement so far. It's still very limited compared to what we would like to see more. And that's why we want to uh, make further progress. But that's not the bar. The bar should go beyond and it shouldn't go down at all. It's not in our interest and the interest of Afghanistan. It's not in the interest of the region. It's not in the interest of the international community. And for a lot of us here at the UN, when we talk about equal representation, fair representation, and all the literature that we have in front of us, that this is going to be a mistake. If it's made, it's going to just reverse what so far we have worked together. I'm just going to stop here. I have a lot to talk. I'm very passionate about it. But I'm going to stop and, and I just must say I'm really enjoying this conversation. It's excellent. It's an area I'm, I have very limited knowledge, but I'm very humbled to hear uh, what everybody was uh, experiencing and sharing uh, your lesson learns. And thank you for, for uh, inviting me. Thank you so much, Ambassador Raz. Uh, Commander uh, Dondia, just very quickly, if I were to ask you, <clears throat> excuse me, for one or two recommendations that you could make uh, to the Department of Peace Operations uh, about a successful uh, diversifying of peacekeeping missions. What would you recommend based on your experience? And uh, Under Secretary General Lacroix, still here listening. Most of the recommendations that I had listed out has already been uh, spoken about by, uh, by Sir. But only one thing I would add, uh, like to add here is that the DPQ, I mean, DPQ is running a lot of uh, courses uh, for the police officers, you know, who are going to be deployed on UN missions and all. So they should uh, fix certain quota in all those courses which are being run by DPQ so that quota for female police officers so that th th those female police officers can undergo specialized training. They can uh, be nominated from their respective uh, countries. Uh, the, the quota should be fixed as far as courses are concerned that are being run by uh, DPK. Like there are certain courses or courses on leadership, and uh, there are so many, so many courses are being run by DPK. So they should have uh, uh, seats fixed for female police officers, I mean, even for the courses, not only for the deployment. I mean, that has to be also to be fixed. I mean, in a mission, a quota for female police officers also to be fixed. And even for courses that are being run by them, it, uh, the quotas for female uh, police officers should also be there. Secondly, which I had experienced from my own, uh, and while uh, we, we were deployed in Liberia, like there has to be a sort of integrated approach towards the process of peace building. I mean, we were there for peace, not only for peacekeeping, but we were there for peace building as well. And there are a number of agencies who are working for this cause. Agencies like 
World Food Program, UNICEF, I mean, number of UN agencies were working there, already working there. So we were not aware as to what those people were doing, how they are planning uh, uh, their, I mean, how, uh, what is their approach towards the problem? I mean, what is their uh, lookout, I mean, outlook for the, uh, 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 for the communities and all. So there has to be sort of integrated approach towards the process of peace building. Like uh, security sector should, uh, should uh, work in tandem with these organizations who are working for the same cause in the mission area. And the uh, third point I would like to say is that member state to contribute liberally, like most of the countries, uh, they have their own problems. They cannot spare uh, female police officers. The UN must have a rider on them. I mean, if UN really wants representation of female police officers in various missions, so UN must have a say in that. I mean, they must stress upon this fact that member state have to have, uh, uh, contribute liberally. I mean, they should not restrict uh, the, the, their female police officers to go out and work. I mean, the nomination should be adequate from the member state. This is all I want to say, I mean, as far as my knowledge and experience goes. Well, thank Thanks. you so much for that. Uh, and lastly, to Dr. Kareem, we've had much discussion today about the obstacle that culture and uh, entrenched attitudes uh, represent for change in the security sector. What are those key levers for change in your estimation? Thank you, uh, Ambassador. Um, so let me just clarify, when, uh, when we talk about cultural change, we're talking about changing the attitudes, as the Ambassador mentioned, and behavior with respect to eliminating gender stereotypes. So moving from the belief that women and men can't do certain things to that they can, as well as removing the, this idea of an in-group and out-group mentality. And so that's really um, when I, what I mean by cultural change. Um, and there's five things that I would emphasize, and I'll make this very quick. Um, so the first is a change in standards. So this is both for recruitment into security forces, but also um, for peacekeeping deployments. Um, some of the, deploy some of the uh, requirements for deployments, such as shooting and driving and computer skills, um, certain rank, et cetera, those tend to privilege men and, and tend to privilege kind of this masculine idea. But we have heard today from uh, Commander Dumbia as well as others, um, and, and in my research, I found that nearly every single person, and I really mean that, um, when asked what is the, the most important skill that's necessary for the success of a peacekeeping operation, they undoubtedly say communication skills, like across the board, communication skills, listening skills, and conflict resolution skills. So what if we made that a requirement for not only just deployments to peacekeeping operations, but also a, a potential standard for recruitment into the security forces in the first place? Those skills are critical for the success of any type of security operation, um, but they don't seem to be a standard for recruitment or a standard for deployment. So that would be um, kind of the, the first requirement, uh, first uh, recommendation for changing culture. Um, as well as, so this goes into personnel recruitment. I think we need to be a lot more particular in the types of people that are recruited um, and make, make it a profession, make it a, something that is an esteemed job uh, so that people have pride in their job, that they value what they're doing, they value helping people, um, which I think is why many people join the police force in the first place, but actually tying recruitment to these kinds of values I think is very important. Um, third, we need to reward positive behavior. So creating new awards and recognition for, for people that engage in peaceful endeavors, that engage in de-escalation activities, that mediate in communities. Um, and then with respect to gender, uh, in, in, in addition to that and what I mentioned, um, you know, something like a male ally award. So making it important and valued to, to engage in work that's related to gender, especially for men. Uh, fourthly, making institutions accountable. So it is imperative that if men and women engage in behavior that's contrary to an inclusive environment, that they should be punished and, and an example should be set. Otherwise, uh, if we engage in behavior, if, if security personnel engage in, in behavior that's uh, inappropriate and that nothing happens, then that is going to be tolerated and that affects the, the culture, right? We know people know that that is that kind of behavior is, is tolerant. And then finally, this has been mentioned, um, and I'm happy to hear that there's, there's uh, a lot of work on this, leadership. 
it is because the security forces are hier a hierarchical institution, it's really important for leaders to take the lead on gender equality. And so senior leaders for sure, but actually my research shows the importance of mid-level leaders. So senior leaders set the priority and the agenda, but it's the mid-level uh, officers that set the example because they're the ones that are leading over the, the foot soldiers, if you will, um, and setting an example. And so they're crucial um, to bring on board in terms of setting an example for the culture. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that. And it, it is interesting that so many of you have reinforced uh, the points that others of you have made. So uh, I think that leads us uh, in a good direction for future action and for continuing to work uh, on these issues. I so want to apologize to our audience. We are over time, we've run out of time, uh, and we can't take audience questions today. Uh, but I do want to thank our extraordinary participants, uh, our co-host, Ambassador Nisebe, thank you so much, Lana, uh, to Undersecretary General Lacroix. It meant a great deal to have you with us, sir, and continued good luck in your important work. Uh, and to our wonderful panelists, um, Ambassador Raz, uh, Commander Donzia, and Dr. Kareem. Uh, thank each and every one of you and continued uh, success in your work uh, because it is so important to the kind of world we wanna see. Uh, and thank you to everyone joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>